Hello everyone. In this experiment, we're going to investigate the properties of concentration cells, which are a type of galvanic cell in which the components of the cathode and anode are identical, but they're present in different concentrations. So I've gone ahead and set up a series of half cells in this honeycomb apparatus you see here, and let me talk a little bit about how this was set up. The dark blue solution that you see is a 1.0 mole per liter solution of copper to nitrate. And each of the other solutions also contain copper to nitrate um, in different concentrations. And so that first one is 1.0 or 10 to the zero moles per liter. The next one is 10 to the negative one mole per liter and that was made by diluting this 10 to one. So I pipetted one milliliter of this into here and diluted to a total of 10. It's down at six now because I transferred some into that first reservoir. That's reservoir number one. This is 10 to the negative two moles per liter, and that's present in this reservoir, and this was made by diluting that 10 to one in yet another graduated cylinder. Here we have 10 to the negative three, and you can see now at this point, it's so dilute that the blue color of the copper two ions is almost invisible, and then 10 to the negative four and 10 to the negative five moles per liter of copper ions. In each of these, we have a strip of copper metal. So each is a copper, copper two plus, or copper two half cell, and we're going to connect these together to see if we can achieve a voltage. Now the first thing I want to show you is that unless we connect these half cells via a salt bridge, no voltage is observed. So for example, if we connect the one molar half cell to the 0.1 molar half cell, a voltage of zero volts is obtained, and you can see that on the voltmeter over here. This is reading in millivolts, a thousand millivolts corresponding to one volt of electrical potential difference. So we need to connect these using a salt bridge of some kind, and for that purpose, we're gonna make use of filter paper. And I'm only gonna connect two of these half cells at a time, and I'm gonna do so briefly because we don't want copper ions to diffuse between the different half cells. One last thing to mention is that this reservoir at the center contains potassium cations and nitrate anions, and those ions will move around as the cell discharges to ensure electrical neutrality in each of the half cells. So, Fairly quickly here, what I'm about to do is add two strips of filter paper, one between the one molar half cell and the central re uh, electrolyte reservoir, and one between the 0.1 molar half cell and that central reservoir. This will, in essence, connect those half cells via a salt bridge, the salt bridge running through the electrolyte solution. Then I'm going to measure the voltage by connecting these leads to the um, to the copper metal in each half cell. And the thing I want you to think about before we get into this, and you should pause the video to think about this, is which direction will electrons flow? Now on this voltmeter, red is the cathode and black the anode. And so electrons tend to flow out of this red lead and into the black lead. Now knowing that, which direction are electrons gonna float out of in this half cell, in this concentration cell rather we're about to create here. Take a few seconds and think that through. Which direction do you think electrons will flow? From cell half cell one to half cell zero? Or from half cell zero to half cell one? Okay, hopefully you've taken a moment to think about that and I'm gonna go ahead and connect the half cells via a salt bridge and we're going to see if we can observe a voltage here. Okay, so this is the moment of truth, right? Where will oxidation occur? Where will reduction occur? Well, let's try the red lead, the cathode lead on half cell one and the black lead on half cell two. The voltage is negative, about negative 49, negative 50 millivolts. If I switch them with the red lead on half cell zero and the black on half cell one, of course we get about positive 50 millivolts, and it's not surprising since we, since we switched the leads. What this indicates is that electrons are coming out of half cell one and going into half cell zero, and that's not surprising if you think about really the origin of this potential difference in this galvanic cell we've created. Now what I'm going to do is remove these strips of filter paper, again trying to cut down on that diffusion of the copper ions between the half cells, and we're going to move to a different pair, combining half cell zero with half cell two. 
So we're going to use new pieces of filter paper to do this. We don't want to contaminate our half cells with ions from those other um, reservoirs. So there's one, and there's another. And we can actually leave in this half cell as we're going to keep connecting to the one molar reservoir over and over again. And now let's take a look at the voltage. Again, let's think this through. Should I switch the leads? Or should I assume that electrons are going to come out of half cell 2? Well, let's assume electrons are going to come out of half cell 2 first. And sure enough, they do. And the voltage looks about 0.053 millivolts. Let's go ahead and record the maximum we saw, which was, sorry, 53 or 52 millivolts there. All righty. Let's get rid of this guy. and move to half cell 3. Now we've connected half cell 0 to half cell 3. And again, let's assume electrons are going to come out of half cell 3. There's a good reason that they should. I'm actually going to switch my hands here. The maximum I saw was about 55 millivolts. Let's try that again. Let's call it 53 there. Alrighty. We're going to remove that piece of filter paper and now move on to half cell 4. There we go. Now we're seeing about 40 millivolts. Again, looking for that maximum value. Of, let's call it 42 millivolts for the maximum. And finally, last but not least, we're going to look at half cell 5 together with half cell 0 there. And, you know, as we're doing this, the thing I want you to really think about is, are these results consistent with the Nernst equation or not? And if not, why do you think that is? That's worth thinking about. And here we have a big jump up to 82 millivolts. Let's try that again just to make sure we got the maximum. Whoa. Saw that get up to all the way up to 96. Let me try that one more time. Uh, and I think we can call that 100 millivolts for the maximum there. So I'll give you some data to actually work up the results of this experiment. But in essence, the thing we should notice is that the voltage is changing as we adjust the concentration of copper two ions in the, I guess we would call it anode half cell. And all of the more dilute solutions are the anode. And that makes sense from a fundamental thermodynamic point of view, if you think this through. I wanted to mention one last thing about the second part of the experiment. After we've measured the dependence of the cell voltage on concentration, we're going to look at the temperature dependence. And in the lab, we would ordinarily do this using a beaker, but I'm just going to demonstrate using our honeycomb setup here hypothetically. And so we've previously measured this half cell at room temperature um, to have a voltage of, mm, let's call it 40 millivolts or so. I've got the leads backwards, so it's negative, but let's get it so it's positive there. Yeah, about 40 millivolts. And the question is, what's the effect of temperature on this? So right now we're at about, say, 290, 293 Kelvin. What happens when I increase the temperature? Well, the Nernst equation has something to say about that. And in the second part of the experiment where we actually make measurements, we're going to adjust the temperatures of these half cells so that the entire galvanic cell is a common temperature and look at what happens to the observed voltage here.